Iona's Skeleton Coast became the newest and eighth transfrontier conservation area of Southern Africa in 2018. The Transfrontier Park connects Skeleton Coast National Park along the coastline of northern Namibia with Iona, the oldest national park of Angola, and is collaboratively managed by the two countries. It is a mega park, almost the size of the Netherlands, and a true wilderness area. Remote, pristine, with a very low human population density. The name Skeleton Coast refers as much to the many whale and seal bones as it bears witness to the difficult conditions for human survival in the desert, especially for the survivors of the numerous ships that sank along the treacherous coast. So this is a uh, staining. It's endemic to the Kaukoveld from about the uh, Palmbach area up to southern Angola. The Transfrontier Park contains a large part of the Kokofeld Center of Endemism and Biodiversity, with both sides of the border sharing several unique animal and plant species, some found nowhere else on Earth, such as the black-faced impala, desert-dwelling elephants, the threatened damara tern, the feather-tailed gecko, the kooko tree euphorbia, and many others. The remarkable Volvicia mirabilis plant also grows here, although it's also found further south in the Namib Desert. The wilderness of the new Transfrontier Park is appealing for ecotourism, but goes hand in hand with the difficult accessibility, not only because it's so far from any population center, but also because of its large sand dunes and impressive mountain chains. Road infrastructure is limited and roads can only be negotiated with four-wheel drive vehicles. The two countries and parks are separated by the Kunene River, which provides an oasis in this arid ecosystem. It is, however, difficult to cross as there are no bridges, while the Kunene crocodiles are known to be very aggressive. The Kunene River flows into the Atlantic Ocean and a very large plume, about 100 square kilometers, of warm, nutrient-rich river water that is taken north by the Benguela Current can be seen on satellite images after good rains. The Kunene Mouth is the second most species-rich coastal wetland of Namibia. Terns, pelicans and egrets are common while large flocks of white-breasted cormorant and greater flamingo trek daily along the river to the coast for fishing. Um, the interesting thing here is that the river mouth is fresh, so it's not an estuary, and that's why it's so nutrient poor. But the coast to the north has got a lot of estuarine characteristics with the mixing of the fresh water and the salt water. So the coast to the north of here is probably as important as the mouth itself. The desert areas of the park are inhabited, but along the Kunene and Kuroka rivers and further away from the coast, where there is more rainfall and the landscape becomes semi-arid, live several semi-nomadic tribes. The main ethnic group is the Ovahimba, that live in the east of Iona National Park and are in close contact. Often, they are family, with the Ovahimba on the Namibian side. Other tribes in Iona include the Kuroka, Kimbari, Mukubal and Mungambwe. The Namibian side of the Transfrontier Park is inhabited, but communities live east of the Skeleton Coast National Park and just south of eastern Iona, across the Kunene. The Ovahimba live semi-nomadic lives, with herders guiding goats and cattle to grazing areas, which can be very far from the villages during the dry season. The Transfrontier Park has to rely on basic institutional structures and infrastructure that are unfortunately insufficient, affecting ecosystem management and wildlife law enforcement. This is reflected by overgrazing, overfishing, poaching, illegal mining and local species extinction, threatening the sustainable future of the Transboundary Park. The predicted drier climate for the park will worsen the situation. Since its independence in 1990, Namibia has been at the forefront of community-based natural resource management, whereby the local communities manage the natural resources on their land, including the wildlife. 
This has allowed a positive growth of wildlife population over 40 years in both Skeleton Coast and the adjacent communal conservancies until a severe drought started seven years ago. The current severe drought has affected the herding practices of the Ovahimba and caused overgrazing in many areas, often to the point of ecosystem collapse. The well-known grasslands of the Murray and Fliss Valley are currently bare and were even visited by flocks of locusts in 2021. Many tribes lost all their cattle in the last years and only have goats left. The drought has also caused an increase in the conflicts between human and wildlife, especially with hungry carnivores such as the brown hyena, lion and cheetah which are attracted to the livestock. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, this tree is, we call it Ochimbuya. Um, if you cut it, you will find some, uh, some milk uh, there. That milk we slaughter goats, we mix with a piece of meat. Uh, that piece of meat, we take it in the bush, we leave it there. If the predator came there, eat that tree, that meat, it will die. While the Namibian communities east of the Skeleton Coast could supplement their income through ecotourism until the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, few communities have seen the benefits from their proximity to the Transfrontier Park up till now. Ecotourism in the Skeleton Coast and Iona National Parks has been restricted to fewer than 2,000 visitors per year up until now, and these are mainly anglers attracted to the cold Atlantic Ocean. Iona National Park in Angola has much less wildlife than on the Namibian side of the Kunene River. Wildlife was abundant till the 70s, when the Civil War started. The new Transfrontier Park will hopefully assist in re-establishing the historic migration patterns and allow wildlife to migrate from Namibia to Iona National Park. Support of the local population will be required to re-establish wildlife populations in Iona. Our project is built on the Namibian experience with community involvement in ecotourism and conservation. We worked with communities in Iona National Park and communal conservancies adjacent to the Skeleton Coast Park to test and introduce solutions for monitoring wildlife and ecosystem indicators. Amongst others, seven Angolan giraffes in Namibia were fitted with GPS satellite transmitters in cooperation with the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. The Angolan giraffe is extinct in the Iona National Park but can possibly be reintroduced. The local communities of Iona were consulted about their perceptions regarding reintroduction. Maybe in another area, but where, the, where he, he, he lived, no, people don't kill the animals. The project also explored alternative means of income generation for the local communities, as their heavy reliance on livestock becomes problematic when livestock densities increase. Our researchers and students trained several para-ecologists within the communities. A para-ecologist is someone with local knowledge that lacks formal academic training and is largely trained on the job in ecological science. Yes. That tree we call it uh, Ohahi. Ohahi. Yeah. Uh, they they named that tree because if you look at it, uh, it's called the different. Uh, the branches are not uh, the same. It's divided. Then the word Ohahi means to divide. But if you look at that tree, you see the branches are going different, different, different. Kuruama is now going to uh, test, do the carbon test for marinas soil um, map. Let's see this one. 
Ooh, positive. We also collected many biodiversity and other ecosystem data in this large, remote and understudied area. So as I talk now, I have no doubt in my mind that a giraffe will survive here and it can reproduce here and it can re increase the population of giraffe in Sadek and Africa as During the Siona project, four new plant species were described, amongst which Euphorbia rimireptans, a plant that lives in the cold and windy fog belt of the inhospitable skeleton coast. Despite the aridity, the area is part of a biodiversity hotspot. We also visited three mountain tops of the Akaokofeld Center of Endemism to assess the biodiversity there. Very few scientific expeditions make it to these mountain ranges, if at all, because of the lack of roads, rocky terrain, the stifling heat and the complete absence of water. Good morning. morning. What did you find yesterday? Well, we found this euphorbia. We are very fortunate to to have found it. Uh, it looks like Euphorbia leisneri or Euphorbia transvalensis. It should be in that group, but we think it's new. So Ernst, what do you say? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite distinct. It grows at this high altitude and uh, yeah, on granite. So while the, the closest related, which we would think is leisneri, is from quite a different climate and, and much warmer conditions. However, the botanical experts on our team had been expecting for decades that these tops are biodiversity hotspots and quite distinct from their surrounding lowland regions. Through the Siona project, we could hire a helicopter to bring us to three mountain tops one in the Ochihipa Range in Namibia, and two in Iona National Park, Serra Chamalindi, and the top of Serra Kafema. The herpetologists in our team made several interesting lizard finds, such as an as yet undescribed girdled lizard, as well as the unique feather tailed gecko, which is an Angolan endemic. The plant biodiversity at the three mountains exceeded all expectations. The tall and endemic Kowokafelt tree euphorbia was found on all three mountains, while the rare short stem candelabra tree was only found on Ochihipa. Many potential new species were found and species only known from Namibia were found in Angola. Right, I can feel some weight. We've got something. On the first morning, so this went through last night. Hello, fatty. Let's look from the other side. From the hind legs, it looks like an elephant shoe. Right, have a look. Go on. Ah, oh, elephant shoe. You can see the white ring around the eye is quite diagnostic. The scales on the tail also often give an idea of the species. So this is definitely not four-toed because you can see the five, the five claws very definitely. The four-toed elephant shoe has a little, almost like a little dew claw, like dogs do. Good. Okay. So we'll um, we'll just collect a little bit of DNA and we'll see some measurements. It goes pretty deep in here. I think we're probably 40 meters below the surface at least. It's a pretty big cabin down here. How was your day, Vera? Oh, tiring. Tiring. Very exciting. Okay. Find anything interesting? Uh, lots of new species in my plots compared to the Ochiiva mountains. Okay. How many species, more or less? Fifty in a plot with a twenty-meter radius. This is a Comifora mollis, 
Many comiforas have a, a nice resin, nice smelling resin. They all uh, part of the mir family. And also molly smells very nice and the himba often collect the resin. So this one is, is not even 100 meters from the top of Serra Fema and they clearly have been camping or sitting here. One of the many surprises at the 2050 meter high mountaintop of Serra Fema was the presence of Euphoria monteroi, subspecies brand Bagensis, previously only known from the Brandberg and Spitzkopper in Namibia. It is a subspecies of the Euphoria monteroi that also can be found in the neighborhood of Vintuk, but it is much taller, up to 1.5 meters. These amazing mountain ecosystems are, however, very fragile, especially as we do not know what will happen when they are more exposed to humans and climate change. They will need extra conservation measures to safeguard them for the future.